percent coverage now of the sewerage network, and that accounts for some of the increase. But actually, it just shows the scale of storm overflow operation in a wet year. And the, the purpose of putting the monitoring in place was to make an argument for more regulation and more investment uh, in storm overflows. And I think you know, the results from last year show exactly why that's required. The system is designed to uh, overflow when it fills up, and storm overflows overflow because that's better than sewage and rainwater backing up into people's homes. But obviously the system is operating far more often than we do expect it to do. So the answer will be better maintenance from the water industry, but actually more investment in the network. And what's planned over the next five years, what the water companies want to do is to invest another £10 billion pounds in improving storm overflows. And that could start to see this problem starting to go away. But actually it might take another 25 years to properly fix the system. Helen Wakeham of the Environment Agency. Well, Fergal Sharkey is an environmental campaigner, vice chair of River Action. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, everyone seems to accept that there were big problems in the past, but where we are now, and we've heard a lot, not least there from the Environment Agency, about there is extra monitoring in place, we are sort of gearing up for sorting this out. Are the right things happening? I have to say that was one of the most extraordinary bits of interview I think I've heard in many, many years. And it's just confirmed my instinct that today was the day that the Environment Agency became nothing more than a lackey and an apologist for the water industry. Um, let me remind your listeners... Well, can you... Go, sorry, do explain why. Let me remind your listeners, sewage should only ever be dumped in exceptional circumstances, in exceptional weather, that's not me saying that. That was the High Court last summer. And 12 years before that, the European Court of Justice, the Environment Agency, knows this. Right. Storm overflows are allowed. I mean, let's just be clear. They, they, are, they, they are allowed. I am, I am telling you that the High Court ruled that it should only ever happen in exceptional weather. That's a weather event so rare, so unique, that it can't really be planned for or foreseen. The truth is, the Environment Agency know, have known for 20 years that the water companies have been acting illegally. That's what the European Court of Justice ruled in 2012. That's what was highlighted by the High Court last year. Okay. The environment so it's a judgment of what exceptional is. It's a judgment of what exceptional is. Now, I, now the, 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 the reality is for them to sit here and actually apologize for the water industry because it rained. That is the most outrageous, contemptuous, mm. incompetent statement I've ever heard a regulator said and actually indicates why we're in the mess we're in. Yeah, but hang and on, you're right hold on. The clean. Environment Agency made clear that, look, she's dis and she was making the point, they're disappointed. They're, they are not where they, they recognise we should be. They, but they, the, they, the, the suggestion they, is that we're heading in the right direction. And the Environment Agency clearly, says that they take enforcement action when illegal well, discharges from the storm overflows are identified. And that, they, that's possible as a result of the monitors, and there are now monitors everywhere. The Environment Agency have been made aware of this problem in 2003 by the European Court, uh, European Commission. They've known for 12 years that what's going on here has been adjudicated to be illegal by the European Court of Justice. Right, and your feeling they is know, nothing has changed. Not, you think they, they haven't done their job in the past not and they're doing not... Their job. They know they've not been enforced in the legislation and they know that the Environment Agency has become nothing more than an impotent, culpable player in what actually now turns out to be one of the most devastating impacts on every single river in this country. What you're witnessing is 30 years of corporate greed, profiteering, financial engineering, and regulatory right. compromise. Okay, so that's so, a three hours. Right. So in terms of trying to sort this out, that because there is has there is this massive investment brought 10 billion into the storm overflows in England um, that's planned. And, it, it, and the, the water companies have made clear it's going. It will mean bills going up. Is it now going in the right direction? Well, again, this is another falsehood. I'm afraid it's been perpetrated by the industry. Of what has now written to the companies and acknowledged as the financial regulator, they have a legal obligation to build, operate, maintain a properly functioning sewage system, and one that only dumps sewage in exceptional circumstances. And more importantly, that for 33 years, we have already provided 
all of the funding needed for water companies to meet that legal obligation, right. something water companies themselves also confirm annually yeah, to exactly. the regulator. So, so the question yeah. should so be asked the off, And off what has been clear, where? customers won't pay twice for investment that should have Correct. already happened. So the truth is, if anybody's going to be paying for this, any investment at this point needs to be made out of shareholders' pockets, and the public should not put another penny of their money right. because well, we do not want to pay twice for okay. something we've already so, paid for and didn't get. Okay, so I'm, I'm uh, just trying to be clear in terms of moving forward. I know you're angry and lots of people are angry about this and we've had lots of sort of uh, fury about the past, but where we are now, given that Ofwat has said customers won't pay twice for investment that should have done, are we now in the right situation? Uh, I don't even think we're close. I think it's actually got to the point with what we've seen today the whole system needs completely overhaul. It needs restructuring of what has failed as a regulator. The Environment Agency has equally failed and is equally culpable. Neither of those institutions are trustworthy. Neither can be trusted to do the job they were supposed to be doing. We need written branch reform and then we can start making progress. Verbal, verbal shot. Thank you so much. Now let's turn to you. The representative of the water companies, David Henderson, he's CEO of Water UK. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do you trust Ofwat and the Environment Agency to be doing the job that they should be doing? Well, I, I think they've got a very difficult job. I, I think they're doing it to the best of their ability. We have a changing climate and we have a growing population and that's putting unprecedented pressure on the network. I think it's fair to say we have not invested anything like what we should have in the past and that's because we've been keeping bills low. Bills have fallen about 20% in real terms in the last 10 years. And because and, shareholders have removed so much from the industry? No, the, the, the returns that have shareholders have received about 3% at the moment. Very at the moment, historically though, and this is the thing, you're, you're dealing with a historic challenge, problem, from people taking money out. No, the returns flow from whatever investment has been allowed and not enough investment has been allowed in the past. That's why we haven't built any reservoir in the last 30 years, even though the population is losing 20%. And it's what's enabled bills to fall 20% in real terms. And nobody wants bills to rise. That's interesting. So off what hasn't allowed you to put bills up, and that would address the problem? Well, if bills had nearly risen with inflation since 2010, we'd have another 10 billion or so able to have been invested. And that would have helped us reduce the amount of spills that we see today. We would have had more storage in the network, less rainwater being able to enter the network, better ability to withstand the pressures of climate change and population growth. And that is what we definitely want to do now. We have a plan to tackle this, to sort this out. We're going to triple the rate of investment if Ofwat give us the green light, and that will see a huge reduction in these spills. We have unprecedented weather events happening much more frequently. There's a, yeah, there's a real problem, isn't there? Because I'm listening to you thinking just there's a lack of trust in the industry because of what's happened before, where people are thinking, look, it's all very well you coming along and saying this, when for decades there's a feeling that actually the investors have done very well and those who want to swim in our waters, who want clean water and rivers that are uh, ecologically sound, uh, are, uh, have, have paid the price. I, and I understand why people are angry. Nobody wants to see sewage flowing to the rivers. But I should say, since privatisation, we've invested about 200 billion. It's taken our drinking water to the highest standard in the world. It has reduced the leaks in our network. It has built up the capacity of our sewage treatment work so that there's far less ammonia and phosphorus entering onto our rivers. We, we're too slow to uh, deal with the issue of overflows. We're absolutely on it now. We have a plan to sort it out. We're going to triple the rate of investment, as I say, and that will bring down hugely the number of spills that we see today. Right. In terms of the spills, though, even under the current plan, which is uh, tripling investment, um, that will cut spills by 40% by 2030. That's correct. And that's more than the gov government's target. So uh, are we talking about... 2030, all going well, everything working as the water companies wanted, that we're still going to have 60% um, of the current spills, these thousands of sewage overflowing into the into the, our waterways. As you say, we're going two and a half times faster than the government's required us to. If we can go even faster, we absolutely will. This is our best estimate as to how fast we can possibly go. There are physical constraints on just how much we can dig up roads, just how much storage it tanks we can install in any given period of time. This is as fast as we think we can go. If we can go faster, we will. We do want to get on and sort this completely. We don't want any spills of sewage in our, in our waterways. Uh, it will take a long time. We have a very large network. If delayed end to end, it would go to the moon and back. It's a very tired system in some parts, and it's quite old. Some parts of it are well over 100 years old. 
So it's going to take time. I think last year they established only 12 percent of it that dates from the Victorian era. So yeah, 12 percent of the distance between the moon and back is a long way. That's a lot of pipes. It's a lot of network that needs upgrading. And, and we have not been upgrading it as much as we should have been. What should right. happen to Thames Water? Because we've got the situation where Thames Water was told to be bust in a month. Oh, look, I can't talk about, about individual companies. I know resilience across the whole network is attested by Offworld to be uh, to be in the right place. But we are, as a network, as, as an industry, dedicated to delivering the service that people want, which is why we have these plans to upgrade the network so that it can reduce the spills that we see across the country. OK, you do represent all the water companies there. You may not... I do be comfortable talking about Thames Water at the moment. But take Anglian Water. It saw the largest increase in the number of spills um, in these latest figures when rainfall in East Anglia was below the av average in England. What's going on there? Well, I, I, I haven't, the, the data came at 9.30 this morning. Across the board, there has been a big increase. I can't explain why individual companies may be higher than others, but a, a law of averages will suggest that some parts of the country have had more spills than uh, in rises than, than others. Overall, though, the only way to bring it down anywhere in the country is to invest, to upgrade our network. We have a plan to do just that. It's with off what We're very keen for them to give us the green light as fast as they can so we can get on and deal with this issue across the whole of England. David Henderson, thank you very much. Coming up in the programme, in Haiti, illegal guns are being trafficked from abroad and fueling violence in the capital. I say to everyone, one, 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 because they are shooting, and then I was shot twice. We report on the increasingly desperate situation. Our hashtag on social media is hashtag BBCWATO, BBC Watto that is. Our email address is worldatone at bbc.co.uk. Now, Finley Bowden was just 10 months old when he died in the early hours of Christmas Day 2020. In May 2023, his parents, Stephen Bowden and Shannon Marsden, were sentenced for murdering him. The judge set a minimum term of 29 years for his father and 27 for his mother. Today, a safeguarding review has said that professional interventions should have protected him. Our Midlands correspondent, Phil Mackey, joins us. Uh, and Phil, this is a, really a, a, an awful case. Yeah, there were 50 pages in this safeguarding review, Sarah, and it makes very sad, but unfortunately quite familiar reading for those of us who have reported on similar cases over the past couple of years, because there were clear opportunities that the authorities had to intervene in the case and perhaps the outcome would have been significantly different. A bit of background, Finley was born uh, to Santa Martha and, and Stephen Bowden, as you say, his mother and father, but there were concerns that he would be at risk before he was born, and so soon afterwards he was taken into care. And he tried, he was described as a happy, bubbly, smiling baby, uh, and for the first nine months of his life he did very well. Unfortunately, a family court ruling uh, just nine months into his life, as I say, meant that he was returned to his parents' care. A month later, on Christmas Day, he, he was dead. He suffered 130 in injuries, the utmost awful cruelty. And during the trial last year, we saw evidence of, of the kind of chaotic existence that he lived, the abuse that he suffered, uh, and ultimately that, that, that awful end that he came to. What were the interventions, even in that short period of time? What were the attempts by the local authorities? Well, they, they had a care plan in place when he was born, as I said, and so things were going well. The problem really came, if you think about the date that he died, Christmas Day 2020, he was born in February 2020. This was just before the COVID pandemic took hold, before the first lockdown, and this is where things really broke down. Now, a lot of things that se seem to go wrong in these cases, like the, the poor sharing of information, a lack of professional curiosity, a, a willingness to believe the parents, more than think about the child's position have happened in this case but they were exacerbated by the lack of direct contact between the various agencies there was a probation service and the social services health and all manner of other organizations that were involved in this care there was no direct contact because of the lockdown restrictions that that meant that meetings happened less frequently they should have had they tended to happen uh, either with phone calls or on uh, you know, our video links, um, the information wasn't shared properly. And, and when it came to that family court decision, 
that allows him back into their care. Nobody was fully aware of, of how bad the situation had got. So Shannon Martin was a heavy drug user, so was Stephen Bowden. But Stephen Bowden already had 32 previous convictions for various offences, including theft and criminal damage, as well as drugs possession. Uh, it probably should never have happened that he went back into their care, but the system was in a state at the time. I've seen this again with other children who died during the pandemic, people at Alpha Lavinia, Hugh Alfie Steele recently in Worcestershire as well. And it does seem that the warnings that were made at the time, Sarah, that the most vulnerable people in our society would be at greater risk, did come true, certainly in these cases. Phil. Phil Mackey, thank you very much. The former city trader Tom Hayes spent five and a half years in prison, one of 19 people convicted in the LIBOR scandal. LIBOR stands for the London Interbank Offered Rate. It was an interest rate that was determined once a day by a group of banks who said what rate they could borrow at, and that would then set the price of other financial transactions from mortgages through to derivatives. In 2012, it was established that the banks were manipulating the rate to benefit their own financial positions. Since then, those convicted in the United States have had their cases overturned. Tom Hayes was hoping that the British Court of Appeal would overturn his conviction today. It has not. It means that the UK is currently the only jurisdiction in the world that treats what traders did as criminal. And he joins us from outside the Court of Appeal. Tom Hayes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You must obviously be disappointed. Resigned, disappointed. I mean, I've lost four times now, but this, uh, this is the fifth time um, that we've taken this issue to the Court of Appeal. So, part of the course, really. Just to be so people understand, do you accept that what you did in the way rates were manipulated or rigged was wrong? No, no, I don't, because there was never a numerically false rate. This, this case was built and bought on the premise. Um, that the rate was commercially motivated, but you know it was accepted that you could toss a coin, roll the dice to choose the number, and therefore you know choosing based on our fiduciary interests of our employer is somehow deemed to be incorrect. When everybody knew that that's the way the rate operated, every person who chose the rate had a fiduciary interest themselves, and. Frankly, you know, the, the Bank of England knew themselves also from at least 2005 that that's how it operated. Right. So you it, it was, it was basically what you were told to do. No, not no, not running on the wrong day defence at all. Um, um, that that would be to mischaracterise everything. Um, it, the, the system was conflicted because the person who chose the rate, known as the submitter, of whom I am um, not one. Um, trading products that were attached to the rate and so the idea that that person working for a, an institution that's driven primarily by revenue in an extremely objective way where the revenue is managed and, and, and monitored can decompartmentalise his brain to choose a rate that's somehow not commercial um, is just for the fairies. Right. Is it, I mean how senior or junior were you in the bank? Um, I was Probably mid-level, um, you know, if you read the final notice into my bank, you can see that my senior managers, my senior senior managers were all aware of everything that I did. Um, so, I mean, you can call that, I mean, obviously I was well paid because I worked in a bank. Um, but I, in terms of my managerial position, I was not senior at all. You have, um, among those sort of campaigning for you, you've had the Labour MP John McDonnell, the Conservative MP David Davis, both of whom suggest that this is a miscarriage of justice. What happens now? Uh, well, I mean, we have opportunity to make written representations to the court in the hope that they will certify a question of law of public importance such that our case can be heard at the Supreme Court. Um, you know, we, and every, 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 the four times previously, that has been refused. And unlike with the civil division of the Court of Appeal, where you can make a direct application to the Supreme Court, if this court refuses to certify, then our route in the United Kingdom is finished. Tom Hayes, thank you very much. From today, on the iPlayer and on BBC Two Northern Ireland, you can watch an astonishing film. It's about an American documentary on the IRA.
armies, it was called, captured IRA leaders and rank and file, planning, preparing and carrying out bomb gun attacks across Northern Ireland. The BBC's Dara McIntyre is the reporter behind tonight's film. And Dara, how did you come across it? Well, that connection goes back almost six years when a source handed one of our researchers some old videotapes that suggested that we might be interested in what was on them. We got them transferred and soon found ourselves sitting spellbound in an edit suite transfixed by what we were seeing. It took time, but we started to put together the story of how the film was made, and eventually we even discovered the original film reels in a back room in a New York apartment. I think it's fair to say, though, that we were rarely less than astonished. This crew is effectively embedded inside the IRA. The most iconic image features Mark McGuinness, who was a leader of a new Northern Ireland government, of course, would meet and greet Queen Elizabeth. But here he is seen handling guns and overseeing preparations for a car bombing. But this crew had access to much more than that. They even filmed in what can only be described as classroom type settings, where IRA members were shown how to make bombs and how to handle guns and weaponry. These instructors included very senior IRA figures, shown full face, with no effort at concealing their identity. Here's a taste of one of those classes where members were shown different types of guns. Now we'll be going into the details of this rifle and the working of this rifle later, but before we do that, I want to pass around these other weapons so we can get the feel of them. This one we're passing around now is the US caliber. This weapon we're handing it on now is the Thompson submachine gun. Right. I want you to get the feel of that weapon as well. This is an ideal weapon for assault groups in close up fighting, and it's a good weapon for street fighting. Now, Dan, I know you've spoken to some of the men who featured in the film. What do they say about it now? Well, one of them we just heard there running the weapons class, that's Des Long. We did discover that some IRA leaders actually approved the final version of the film, but Des Long had never seen it until we showed it to him. He now regrets having any part in it. When they were making it, my bell told me to that, and I said, I, I want a mask. Oh, he says, we, I tell you, he says, you'll be shown from the, from the chest down. And that was a verbal promise for him, and it meant nothing. The whole thing was just, oh, should never have been made. I'm sorry to this day I ever took part in it. One big question, of course, is why and how did this film disappear? Mm. And there are at least two thoughts on that which we explore. One is that the 1972 film's portrayal of the IRA was seen as too romantic by US TV executives. The other is that the British government applied pressure on the US authorities, who in turn persuaded TV companies not to show it. It could never have passed British or Irish censors at the time, of course. So the film was only ever seen by a few private audiences. Now, there is another story sitting behind the original film, and that's the exact knowledge and role of intelligence agencies. We have some compelling evidence that we share in our documentary that suggests British intelligence, but also possibly their American and Israeli counterparts knew of the film as it was being made. Which seems extraordinary, the idea that you have people obviously not being masked and British intelligence, I mean, they would have presumed that British intelligence would not see it, but you have some evidence that they did. Well, yes, uh, and we actually think, in fact, that, you know, the IRA, uh, I think, were persuaded that, persuaded of the value that they could make this film and put it out as long as they controlled the actual content. Now, as we, ex as we explained in, in the film, they didn't have the control that they expected to have. What this was all about, from the IRA's perspective, was a propaganda boost in America. And I think the timing of this is the filming and the, the, and, and the film itself is crucial too, because it was, in the, it was made in the period after Bloody Sunday, when 13 civilians were shot dead by the parachute regiment, the 14th victim would die later, and at a time when the IRA leadership was coming down with recruits and when the British government had closed down the local Stormont administration. So it's at a time when the IRA thought they were on course for victory. The organisation was on a high in many ways, and I think they wanted this film to document that. Dana McIntyre, thank you very much. Um,
Darrow's documentary called The Secret Army. It's available on the BBC iPlayer now, and it'll be on BBC Two Northern Ireland tonight at 9pm. And it'll be on BBC Four. Illegal weapons from abroad are fueling the gun violence in Haiti. And that will be one of the many huge challenges the country's new, unknown leader will have to tackle. Details of a presidential transitional council have yet to be revealed, more than two weeks after the country's prime minister resigned following a surge of violence in Port au Prince. The UN has already warned that arms trafficking, particularly from the US, has powered the gangs who've taken over, displacing thousands of people. Our correspondent, Nomia Iqbal, sent this report from Cat Patient. The capital of this volatile nation is a war zone. For a country that doesn't manufacture weapons, every type of gun is flooding port of prince High-powered rifles such as AK-47s, 9mm pistols, sniper rifles, belt-fed machine guns. It's the main cause of a staggering surge in Haiti's gang-related violence. Juliet has faced that violence firsthand. She used to work as a party planner in Porter Prince, an event she catered for was ambushed by gangs. Before me, I said to everyone, one, 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 because they are shooting, and then I was shot twice. Before. Juliet shows me the bullet scars on her arm and chest. She sobs and she recalls how 10 people were killed, including her 22-year-old business partner. She fled to Cap Nation, carrying her suitcase and scars. At the beginning, our political leaders began to intend to stop these gangs. The gangs are everywhere. The 50-year-old now lives in a small space, sharing a bed with a friend. She can't go back to her home because gangs have moved in. Cabation is the only safe place I know of in Haiti right now. That safe haven is why buses keep coming into Cap Haitian every day, braving the dangerous drive along gang-controlled roads. More than 30,000 people have desperately fled the violence in the capital, paying high prices to make the journey here. There is a moment of relief as one father sees his 14-year-old son climb down the stairs with his van. David is safe. The journey was very long, more than six hours. I was praying the whole way. There were a lot of gunshots in one area. Our bus just missed them. People on the bus are exhausted and upset. One man says he has a message to America. All the guns here are from the U.S. If the U.S. want to stop this, they could do it in one minute. There is no exact number for how many trafficked firearms are currently in Haiti. A U.N. report in January said some estimates put it at half a million weapons here as of 2020. There are dozens of gangs all fighting for power. This is the voice of Ezo, a popular rapper, but also rival to the man who is considered the main gangster in charge. Jimmy Teresia, known as Barbecue, is said to more or less control his prince. These armed groups have all been able to take advantage of the death spiral Haiti has found itself in in the last decade, due to natural and political disasters. For me, it's just like the, the, the nightmare. Charles Edouard Durant says he's never seen it this bad in Haiti, but he doesn't think the gang is his breath. Are they scared of coming here? Of course, yes. Because we were playing with them. Honestly, we were playing with them. Because he's a gangster, but come, he's not coming to play. So we're not playing with them. The US State Department announced the plan last year to work with Haitian police to tackle gun trafficking. But there is no head of state right now, effectively no government, and a yet to be announced presidential transitional council that's already been viewed by many people here with suspicion. It means gun violence is yet another vicious circle Haiti is trapped in with no clear way out. Let's talk about death. 
That's something we've done a bit recently after England's health ombudsman suggested that as a society we need to get better at planning for it and talking about it. Last week we spoke to Adrian Charles about the death of his father. Something he should have expected but for which he felt completely unprepared. As one of our listeners subsequently emailed, the death of anyone close to you rips a hole in the very fabric of being. The things you assume can no longer be assumed. That person's loss, even if expected, ruins all your expectations of the future. The actor and writer Greg Wise is working with the hospice care charity Marie Curie to get death included in the national curriculum. He had a close friend die when they were young, then his parents, as expected, but also his sister. The parents? You can kind of deal with that's expected, but losing a friend at an early age isn't, and losing a sister at an early age isn't. And both brought me up short in the most profound way, and now the most wonderful way because I'm able to talk about this stuff that people don't talk about. So it's a, it's a huge privilege. sort of more important because it's the culmination of hopefully a well-lived life. And in the case of your sister, you were particularly close to it because I think you sort of gave up everything to move in with her and look after her. I was very fortunate. I'm self-employed. I had a very understanding family. Um, I was able to excuse myself from my life and move in with her for the last two months of her life. And she was at the point which I think a lot of people get to where she was ashamed by her illness. She was ashamed by what she had been made from it. She was a powerful woman. She had a powerful job and an expense account and a hundred pairs of shoes and all the rest of it. And that is completely taken away from her. And she didn't want to see anybody at all when she got very ill. Well, she, I think, had she had chemotherapy, radiotherapy, she had everything. She had the kitchen sink thrown at it. And this is another conversation that we really need to have with our medical brethren to be able to know when to say stop. I would assume we could say to the National Health Service billions of pounds of needless treatment because the medical professionals and the families and the people who are going through the illness can't bring themselves to have the conversation of there is no point in doing another round of chemotherapy. There is no point in doing another round of radiotherapy. Now we go palliative. And the extraordinary thing about palliative care is the sooner you access it, the longer you live, and the better quality of life you have. It is not a failure at all. But do you think that's the problem, is almost um, the way doctors are trained we, we, we all, and, and the way we react, we don't give doctors permission to say, look, this is, there is another route. It works, it works both ways. Um, I have a wonderful friend who uh, was a, uh, an oncology surgeon who then got breast cancer. She was saying that, that even as a, as a houseman, even once she had trained and was on the ward, they didn't use the word cancer. They called it a lump or a shadow. No one was taught about death. Doctors, I think, are still coming through the system seeing death as some sort of failure. And surely, if, especially if you're an oncologist, you have to understand that a large percentage of people coming through your office every day are going to die on your watch. We have to train better, and I think this training has to come into general life as well. I think we have to start to talk to our schools. I know you're working with Marie Curie to get it into the national curriculum. What would you teach in school? Kids are talking about death. Kids are really, in that way, morbid. 
I think they're very open to it all. I think especially now since the pandemic. And again, it's, it's difficult because the miscommunication with children. You say to kids, wash your hands, or granny dies. Granny then dies, it's the kid's fault that granny's dead because the kid is not dead. Children are storytellers, they'll always be able to, to tell the story between a cause and an effect. We have to be more adult. I think we're all still tremendously adolescent and kind of talking about this. And part of that is something called a death box. Which, <laughs> which, could you explain what, what, what goes in a death box? I don't know if you've ever had to unpick someone's life after a death, um, going through probate, and you find yourself on the end of a phone with someone's pension provider or their mobile phone provider. Hearing, I'm sorry, we can only talk to the account holder. And I'm saying, I'll just not explain, we can't tell you today. The death box has everything. It is a pure act of love to those left behind after you who are trying to sort things out after your death. All your past work. Who has your pension? Who's your account holder? Where the spare key is for the thing. All of this stuff, because we're in such deep, deep grief, obviously, at the death of the coast. Or and if we're then having to endlessly try and work out the pragmatics of going through a probate, it drives me mad just to think.